assessors of whether or not someone's confession is valid. You say, whoa, I didn't realize that I had that level of authority, and I want to show that to you this morning. Do you know that only two times in your Bible, Jesus actually uses the word church? So if, if the two times that Jesus uses the word church, we ought to know how he's using it. So that's why we're in Matthew 16. I want us to begin reading in verse 15. It reads this way. Jesus said to them, the apostles, who do you say that I am? Simon re Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven." This is the who and the what of the gospel. That is, Peter, you are the one confessing this, and you are doing so correctly. So, so the first thing is this. Jesus is, going, Jesus is going to build his church on this confessor confessing the right confession. And second of all, because of this confessor, Confessing the right confession, Jesus is going to pull out of his pocket the figurative keys of the kingdom, and he is going to hand them to Peter, who represents the apostles, and those keys are the authority to bind and to loose. And here's what's amazing. I'll, I'll explain what binding and loosing here is in a moment. But amazingly enough is this, is that the gathered church is now going to be given the same authority. You say, Pastor Joel, where do you see that? I want you to turn now two chapters later to Matthew 18, the passage that David read for us. Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. See if you can pick up on the lingo, language, that's the same here in Matthew 18 as was found there in Matthew 16. Verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. Now, if he refuses to listen to them, Jesus says, tell it to the church. If he refuses to listen even to the church, well, let him be to you as a Gentile and tax collector. The, the verses, I'm going to read verse 18 in just a moment, but verses 15 through verses 19 or 20 there, that's not just principles of how you reconcile uh, conflict within relationships. It's actually, there's principles there, but it's actually much bigger than just that. This scenario that, I, that we just read involves three rounds of an individual sin being evaluated and assessed. The first round is this, to go and talk to the person privately. If that doesn't work, bring one or two more with you. And if that doesn't work, finally, what are you supposed to do? Tell it to the church. And what will happen with, if they refuse to listen to the church? Look at verse 18. Right? This is right on the heels of let him, if he refuses to listen to the church, he's going to be a Gentile and a tax collector. Verse 18. Truly I say to you, church, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And just so that we're all on the same page there, when he says, truly I say to you, let me use text in there. It's plural. It's y'all. <laughs> Tell it to the church, and, and truly I say to you all, whatever you, what, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. That is, the, the congregation. And so there are 
at least three building blocks to congregationalism. And the first building block is this, is church, church members are given keys. I want to ask this question, who in this passage, or in chapter 16 and also in verse 18, who is given the keys of the kingdom? Is it a bishop? Are the elders of the church given the keys? Now, I'm arguing from Matthew chapter 18 that it wasn't just Peter who has the ability to have those keys of the kingdom, the ability to bind and to loose, but according to verse 18, after you speak it to the church, who has the ability to bind or to loose? Not a bishop, not a, not a group of elders sitting around a table, but the congregation. The church members are, are given the keys. Now, just like a 16-year-old who needs to know the power of keys when you hand them over, when they get behind the wheel, right? Well, if you're given a set of keys by Jesus, and these keys aren't the keys to a 2014 Ford minivan or whatever it is, but these are the keys to the kingdom, then you need to know what's, behind the, po- what's the power behind those keys, right? What do, what do keys do? Uh, keys have the ability to unlock and to lock, right? Or if we're going to use Jesus' words, we wouldn't say to, to lock and to unlock, we would say to bind or to loose. But, but what, are these, what are these keys binding people to, right? Or what are they loosing? What are the keys of the kingdom? What are they loosing people from? Well, they're called the keys of the kingdom. These keys bind people to God's kingdom or they loose people from God's kingdom. Right? Because he says, hey, you, first of all, you go to them one-on-one. If that doesn't work, if they don't repent of that, then you bring someone else. If that doesn't work, then what do you do? You tell it to the church, and if the, he refuses to listen to the church, what is the, what's supposed to happen? Well, they're supposed to be to you like a Gentile or tax collector. Because why? Well, because whatever you bind on earth will have already been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will already have been loosed in heaven. That is, the keys of the kingdom given to the congregation is this, is you have the ability to assess and discern. These keys bind people to God's kingdom or loose people. So question, where is God's kingdom visibly seen? It's the church, right? The the answer to that is this, the gathered assembly of God's people who have agreed to live out the one another's of the New Testament. That's That's where God's kingdom is seen. The gathered church has the ability, I would argue from these texts, the authority and the responsibility to stand in front of a gospel confessor to consider whether his or her gospel confession and life and life and to announce an official official judgment, that is, to bind or to loose on heaven's behalf. Grace Life, we say this in our membership classes. At Grace Life, we are elder-led, deacon-served, and congregationally governed. But what does elder-led congregationalism look like? Let me me contrast for a moment. Depending on your faith background, maybe as a kid you didn't even understand this or recognize this or quite frankly care. In Anglican, uh, Methodist, or Roman Catholic churches, a bishop, right, a bishop is given the final authority over several churches. You follow that. Or you could have bishops underneath the head bishop, if you will, the archbishop. But nonetheless, the final authority in those, congreg- in the, in those uh, churches are given to the bishop. We, have, we pray for, I don't know if we pray for any, I don't, I, I'm sure there are, I, I don't know them personally, um, but we would pray for Anglican, gospel preaching Anglican churches in, in our community if I knew their pastors, and certainly I know that there are good Bible preaching Methodist churches. 
some of we pray regularly for Presbyterian churches whom we're friends with. Presbyterianism gives the authority of the church to a gathering of elders, not over one local congregation, but over several congregations, called a session. Now, I'm going to tread on a little bit of thin ice here, because many of whom I'm going to say next, or many are my friends, but many of our, many, not all, but many of our Bible church and non-denominational friends often advocate for an elder rule. Again, I say many, and this isn't in every case, meaning that the final authority belongs to the elders, as far as on membership, uh, to, to that church. They're the ones letting in, and they're the ones releasing. I'm arguing that the church, the gathered church, the congregation, is to have the final say, not the elders, not a bishop, not even a subset like a life group. That is, that church, the church, the gathered congregation, are given some keys And so the second building block then is this, is that church members, you are required to use those keys. I don't know, did you ever grow up, my grandparents, my my grandfather was a rancher out in Wyoming, and uh, when I was a small, small boy, when I was bored at my grandma's house, and he was out taking care of animals or whatever, I was way too small to be helping, and so to keep me occupied, believe it or not, there was no Wi-Fi, Right? heaven forbid, and she would give me things to play with, and so I remember this, I had a jar of buttons, what am I, what is a five-year-old boy going to do with buttons, and she would dump them out and say, pick them up, and that's what I did, you say, that's really boring, yes, it was really boring, I'd much rather have Wi-Fi, okay, but there was another set thing that she would often do, she would give me a box, and you know what was awesome about this box, there were keys, all sorts of keys in the box, For you who have a little bit of gray hair, there were skeleton keys in that box of every variety. And there were other types of keys, maybe keys to an old car or to an old barn or to to a building. The point was this, is that I would ask my my grandmother and my my grandpa, I'd say, hey, what are you, where are these keys for? And no one knew what they were for except for to keep Joel and his brothers occupied when they were bored. What good are keys if you have them and you don't know how to use them, Right? And maybe you've got a little drawer at home where you're like, oh no, I've got a key. I better not throw this away because you never know when I might need it again, even though you have no idea what that key is for, right? So what good are keys to the kingdom that our risen, ascended Lord gives to the congregation if we don't use them? How, do, how does a congregation use kingdom keys? Right? When you become a member, believe it or not, there's no secret handshake, and we don't give you a, we're not talking about a key to the front door or a key to the back door. We don't give you a key to the kingdom, anything like this. These are figurative, metaphorical keys. How does a congregation use the keys to the kingdom? Here is how you do it. You do it the exact same way our Lord did it in Matthew 16 when he's listening to Peter. The congregation listens and you give a verdict. That is, this is or is not a right gospel confession. Or, or and, that is or isn't a true gospel confessor. Do you follow the logic there? Using the keys then is to render a judgment on what, a confession, and a who, the confessor. The what and who of the gospel. Well, let me be very clear on this, say this. The congregation isn't making someone a Christian or not a Christian. But rather, they are, we are functioning like a judge in a courtroom is announcing a verdict, guilty or innocent. Right? The judge isn't making the law. The congregation isn't making the law. All we're doing is interpreting the data like Jesus did with Peter when Peter says, you know, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And, Peter, and Jesus says, whoa, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. And so when we hear the testimonies up on the screen, it's not all for us all just to go, wow, what a great story. It's for us internally to go like this. That 
is a true gospel confession. That is a true gospel confessor. They interpret the data. So look at verse 15 again. Matthew 18, verse 15. Right? This is the data gathering and collecting stage. Matthew 18, verse 15. So in this case, right, it begins with, if your brother. So this is someone who has already, who has already been affirmed in their confession. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother. It's all good. If he doesn't, well, take one or two others along with you, that every charge be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. And if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. Well, what's the church supposed to do? Well, if he refuses to listen to even the church, the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. That's not Amish shunning. Because he says, truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. The keys allow the congregation then to add or to remove members based upon their confession. That is, it's not those in attendance on a Sunday that make the church visible. It's those individual Christians who are committed together in membership that makes the invisible body of Christ visible. That only those who voluntarily submit to one another in this way. That is, when a judge speaks, it has real, real world consequences, right? Either good or bad. When the church speaks on behalf of heaven, it too has real world consequences to bind someone. They are a gospel confessor. They've repented of their sin. Or to loose them. They are not that though they're confessing the Lord with their mouth, that their life is not reflecting the kingship of Jesus Christ. Congregationalism argues that Christ's churches are to practice formative discipline and corrective discipline. I know your brains are on overload right now. This is the first time in 11 years I have ever preached on congregationalism, and can I let you in on a little secret? I have never heard congregationalism preached on on a Sunday morning in 20 years of ministry. So I understand that we're in new territory. Let me, get, let me continue with our car illustration. Formative discipline, corrective discipline. Uh, if you're a parent or if you've ever babysat kids, you know what this is. You know what formative discipline is. Uh, car illustration. Learning when and how to merge in traffic, traffic Learning to, like when you're, like, I still remember when my dad was teaching me how to, to drive, right? And he says, hey, Joel, the speed limit's 35, right? It's not 54. <laughs> that's, that's, what is that? That's formative discipline. Hey, pay attention. Uh, turn your blinker on. Turn your blinker off. What, why'd you turn in the lane there? There was a car there. Those are all, that's formative discipline, teaching me how to drive in a correct manner. Do you know where corrective discipline comes in? When a parent's teaching their child, right? Corrective discipline is when you receive a second speeding ticket within two weeks and you take the car keys away, right? That's corrective. Church membership, here's why membership is so, so valuable. Church membership is formative discipline. Brother, you're not supposed to turn into the next lane like that, but like this. Sister, spiritually speaking, turn the blinker on before you turn left. That's formative discipline where we encourage and instruct one another in our gathered worship. When the scriptures are being read to us up there, when Pastor Ben was admonishing or encouraging us from the Colossians passage, that is formative discipline. That's right. Christ holds all things together. And then when we sing that song, it's not like, oh, I'm just, boy, I really like that melody. Or I really wish, I don't know, the, I wish the drum line was a little bit heavier. Or I wish the bass line would come through or something to that. That, that. that has nothing to do with it. All of that is forming us, formative, spiritually. 
when we gather in our gathered worship, in our life groups, correct, here's where corrective discipline comes in. Corrective discipline is using the keys of the kingdom not only to bind someone, but this is where churches often fail, but also to loose someone. Or to use Bible language here to practice church discipline. Are you still with me? It's a little over in the weeds, I understand. Next week we'll be in Proverbs. Hang on. Pastor, I, I get that's your understanding of these verses, and I can even kind of see logically how you get there. I, I get all of that, but still, this seems like a, Tuesday, a nerdy kind of Tuesday morning pastor conversation. Are, are there any places in the Bible that would demonstrate that this is the pattern for a local church? Can you demonstrate, can you pull that out and show me illustratively where this has actually played itself out in the New Testament, all right? So kids, are you with me? You write these references down. We're going to show you three references. Moms, I'm just trying to help you out here, okay? All right? Let me show you three places, in, but let me, let me give you the third building block for congregationalism. That is this, church members, you must exercise those keys for the church's health and God's glory. You're in Matthew 18. Let's switch over to 1 Corinthians 5. We're going to be in two places in Corinthians and one place in Galatians. So go to 1 Corinthians 5. In 1 Corinthians 5, the story reads like a headline at the grocery store checkout counter. Come on, you know those ones. Don't tell me you've never looked at those, right? It reads like this, right, in 1 Corinthians 5, you know, Christian man has an affair with his stepmother. What? That's how the passage reads. Look at 1 Corinthians 5, verses 1 through 5. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans. For a man has his father's wife. What? And you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. Paul says, though absent in body, I am present in spirit, and as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. And when you, when you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. I have a question for you. Who is Paul instructing? The church. Who is Paul correcting? The church. Who is Paul holding responsible? The church. Are the elders of that church guilty? Yes. Is the congregation guilty for allowing that sin to go on unrepentant? Yes. This is church discipline. But, but, but folks, the reason why I said before it's not Amish shunning, because what's, what's Paul's point in verse 5? Deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. But look at how the end of verse 5 reads. So that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. The purpose of discipline is always restoration. The purpose, once someone has been bound, if, if, something has to be, if someone has to be loose because they're not repenting, Matthew 18, is so that their spirit may be saved in the day of our Lord. The purpose has always been restoration. Two summers ago, every one of us in this room was horrified when we woke up on the Sunday morning. Whether or not you subscribe to the Houston Chronicle, you saw the headlines. As the Houston Chronicle for three or potentially four weeks did an expose on Baptist churches where sexual abuse was covered up. Grace Life, I want to ask this question. What should have been the church's response of those hundreds of churches that covered up sexual abuse? There should have been a twofold response. The first response was a phone call to 911 or to the powers that be, the authorities. And the second response should have been in the next members meeting 
to discipline in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that they would be handed over for the destruction of the flesh, but so that in the end that their spirit would be saved. You see, is the church full of hypocrites? Apparently, yes, not just in 2023, but even in the first century. But actually, God has a way to deal with hypocrisy within the church. And it is through this idea of binding and loosing people. I remember, I still am struck by this. I remember talking to a friend of mine who grew up in the church, in the Christian church. His dad left their family, ran away with uh, another woman. I don't know if it was in the church or at work. I don't remember what it was. But his dad was involved in the church. He served. This, this man who ran away with another woman and left the family, his son, who's my age, he said this to me. He said, Joel, to my knowledge, no one in the church ever confronted my dad. He said, I was a 13 or 14-year-old boy at the time. And I'm quoting now. He said, I often wonder if things would have ended up different for our family had the church practiced what the Bible taught. It's like this is not some type of legalistic practice. This is how Jesus keeps his body pure. That's the first passage. Second passage is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. This is a little bit more cloudy, but I think you can I think it's still clear enough to bring home the point. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2 beginning in verse 5. I'm re reading this to you for two reasons. One, to show you that congregationalism is not just western democracy in action, but that it actually was practiced in the 1st century. Look at verse 5. Paul says to the church, Now, if anyone has caused pain, he has caused it not to me, but in some measure, not to put it too severely, to all of you. Right? Because you all are together in this body. Look at verse 6. For such a one, look at this next phrase, this punishment by the majority is enough. So that you should, so you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him if he repents, is the idea, or that he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow, hopefully then thus leading to repentance. I, I read those verses to you to primarily bring up to you that phrase in verse 6 for such a one, that is an individual, this punishment by the majority is enough to say that the congregation is the one who enacted on this, acted on this. Was it a show of hands? Was it a secret ballot? I, I don't know. But apparently they had a way to assess who was allowed to actually speak to this, or we would say vote or affirm or loose in this context. And here's the final passage. In Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, a passage that I have referenced on a number of occasions here, reads this way. Galatians 1 verse 6, Paul says to the churches that are across Galatia, who are reading this letter individually, he says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one. But there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. If an apostle or an angel were to be unfaithful to the gospel, who is to reject their teaching and even pronounce them cursed? The congregation is the churches, the local church. Why, why should a congregation exercise this authority? 
whether it's about false teaching or about someone who espouses Christianity but whose life falls far short from that. Why should a congregation exercise this authority? Isn't that a little harsh? It is for this reason, to make clear to those inside the church and to those outside the church, you can't call yourself a Christian and act like that, or you can't call yourself a Christian and teach that. It is the church's responsibility. It is the gospel that saved you. It is the gospel that is shaping you. And in turn, it is your responsibility to protect the very gospel that then rescued you. We're not out on witch hunts. Every one of us in here knows that we are the biggest sinners in Cyprus. We're not attempting to hide or cover our sin. We want to be open and honest that we are sinners and that we are repenting sinners. The gospel that saves also sanctifies. So we say it this way, right? The church is for any sinner. And specifically, it is for any sinner who repents of their sin. The church is not a club for the self-righteous. Jesus did not come to call the righteous, but what? Sinners to repentance. To belong to the body of Christ is to confess then that my good deeds are not enough, that I need the righteousness of Christ. Friend, have you, have you ever come to the jarring realization that unless Jesus alone saves me, I am doomed and I am damned? That on the cross, the Son of God received the punishment that I should have received. That I deserved death. That I deserved separation from God the Father. That is, the Christian gospel is not enough to just simply give mental assent. I believe Jesus, I believe he died on the cross. And it's just somehow kind of just just enough mental assent. But actually this, that you must call upon the name of the Lord individually, personally, and you will be forgiven. You will be saved. To to use Jesus' language, you will be born again. And the reason we join a church after salvation is not, please hear me, is not for some moral superiority but so that the formative discipline in our lives can have its effect. How often, I, how often I am rebuked by listening to others pray in my life group. Because I'm praying like, dear Jesus, give me a good day. And they're praying, oh God, sanctify us, save us, do a work in our life how regularly I am strengthened in my resolve to walk with the Lord by your singing. Because when we sang, He will hold me fast, I know enough about some of what's going, in people, going on in people's lives that it really is. It really, they're just crying it out. Hold me fast. How frequently I am encouraged by your faithfulness in the midst of adversity. How repeatedly I am challenged by your ministry one to another. Brothers and sisters, please have this emblazoned in your soul that church membership is not your name on a piece of paper. It is a job responsibility tasked to you by the risen and ascended Christ that his body, not perfect, would be formed and shaped into his image. You have a responsibility by your Lord to shape each and every one of us around us to honor and to live for the Lord. Brothers and sisters, a healthy church is God's primary discipleship tool in our lives. Let's pray. Father.